Uh, thank you so much. It's great to um, see you all. This, is, uh, this may be one of those big uh, uh, lectures uh, and, uh, of this lecture series. I, I count, I was standing back there, I counted there is something about 85 people sitting here. So, um, welcome uh, to Vienna. Welcome to this uh, summer school. Um, and uh, great to have you here. I'm going to tell you uh, about uh, how we start from the disk where uh, the previous lecture left and get to planets like the one that you are standing on. Uh, so I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about the practical issue of it. Um, I am a theorist, so I'm going to uh, tell you about the physics of what goes into modeling. I'm not going to talk about any models. I'm just going to tell you about the physics and I'm going to let physics carry us to where it's supposed to be. Uh, being a theorist, um, I don't do observation, I don't do experiment, I use my hands and pen and paper. So these are my, this is going to be my uh, preps. And what I need you to do is to, uh, when I say visualize a disk or visualize this or that, do that. And that, that, that way I can carry you along. I want to tell you about the thought process that goes into this whole thing based on the physics that, that comes out of it. And uh, um, then we'll see where physics take us. At a certain point, in, it will be inevitable to talk about uh, uh, models and present some models. And at that time, I'll tell you why and uh, present some of the models and results. So every time we talk about planet formation, uh, the first thing we do is that we put solar system up there and we say that, um, that we use that as a, as a model, as a ground to develop our planet formation models. The reason for it is that this is the best planetary system that we know. Many missions to different parts of the solar system have revealed many of these characteristics. Uh, its chemical properties, its dynamical properties and all that. And that's what we need to set up the initial conditions for the models that we want to develop and uh, choose the right physics. Um, however, we all know that solar system is not the only planetary system out there. There are thousands of them, thanks to Kepler and the ground-based telescopes. Many, many have been discovered with a variety of different characteristics, and uh, almost all of them different from our solar system. Our solar system basically is an oddball in all this. So as a theorist, you can do two things. You can say, I'm going to forget about solar system. I'm going to put solar system among these 4,000. And then I'm going to sit back and look at this and see what I can do, what I can deduct from all this to the, make my uh, models of planet formation. Or what the, the easier way would be to go back there and say, I know this way too well. I'm going to use this, develop my models based on that, and then extend it to these. Right? So we'll see which direction to go. But here is a thought question for you all. We are sitting on a planet that is habitable in a solar system that has giant planet farther away and terrestrial planet closer in, right? What if we were sitting on a habitable planet with a hot Jupiter in front of us, right? Then, and we didn't know anything. That was the system that we would use to develop our, our uh, formation models. Then what would we say about our solar system? If someone would actually detect Jupiter at 5 AU sitting on the, our hypothetical planetary system, how would they develop a planetary model and extend it to our solar system? Think about it. At the end of the, um, at the, end of the lecture, I get back to it, and you will see, regardless of what you do, uh, the physics is the same thing, and the physics carries you only in one direction. And if you do it right, the answer is always the same. Um, the point is, at the time that this whole process of planet formation started, there, was, there were no planets. What it was, it was all gas and dust. You saw the previous two lectures, and they did a fantastic job to explain how this whole thing came about with a disk uh, resulting into stars and a disk becoming planets. It was all gas and dust. What I'm showing here is one of the huge, huge cloud collapsing and more, uh, making uh, multiple stars. And uh, what you see is, uh, it's going to zoom in, and you will see some of the stars coming up. There are disks around them. So the, long story short, it, there were no planets at the beginning. Uh, it was all gas and dust. So um, if you want to develop any model or understand planet formation, you have to start from the beginning, where it was gas, dust, and see where it takes you. So because of that, um, most of the understanding of planet formation is from a collapse of molecular cloud and that collapse results into formation of star. The star interacts with the material in, in surrounding, forms a disk and the disk will have a mid-plane and a solid material will settle on the mid-plane and then somehow it becomes planet. So you see um, many of these disks around here. So this is a cartoon of what I just explained. You have a molecular cloud collapsing and star forms, and the star dictates what's going to be the um, fate of the disk, and then things go from there. Star affects its surrounding as the star forms. There is radiation, that there is solar wind, and a variety of different ways to clear up the disk. 
and the disk gets cleared up and there is bipolar radiation going in opposite direction and the top and bottom gets cleared up and the disk basically uh, cuts the star half, right? Um, the previous talk did a fantastic job to show you that the disk is puffy as you go farther away, the, it pops up. But the bottom line is that what happens to planet formation happens inside this disk and not in every part of it, in a specific region. And the reason for it is that your dust particles and gas interact with each other in a certain way. Uh, just to show you that what we see here is just not a cartoon. Um, these are uh, observation of disks and the disks are there and there and uh, uh, where is it, there and there. And you see that there is um, bipolar uh, clearing of the surround materials uh, surrounding the disk and all that. Okay, so now let's go back to this cartoon of the disk and see what is inside of it and how we can start from there and where it takes us. So you have a disk and it has only gas and dust in it, right? Um, <clears throat> I'm showing two types of cartoon here. Uh, in the, when you are close to this, in the part of the disk that is close to the star, you receive uh, uh, radiation, receive heat. I'm going to make it very, very simple, no technical. Just uh, assume that we are teaching Astro 101. You receive heat, and that heat hits up the disk. As you go farther away, the amount of heat that the disk receives is going to be less, so it's going to be colder and colder and colder. And that affects, that uh, change of temperature affects the way that solid material reacts with the gas and what happens to it. <clears throat> the bottom line is that the planet formation occurs in the mid-plane. So whatever material that is up there, down here, is going to rain on the mid-plane and then when this mid-plane is sufficiently um, uh, filled with solid material, then planet formation starts. As, as I'm going through this, pro, uh, uh, through this lecture, there are a few slides that uh, I will pause on and I will present those as take home message. So if you don't take anything from these 50, 60 minutes, uh, there are four or five slides that I want to take uh, from, from this. And uh, I'll pause and explain those. This is one of those. The onset of planet formation, that is, the coalescence of dust particles and their growth to larger bodies, is a natural and inevitable consequence of the formation and evolution of protoplanetary nebula. If you have dust particles, I'll show you, it's all physics. You can't stop it. If you have dust particles, they come close, they stick together, they grow. The story of planet formation is whether this process can continue successfully to form a planetary system. It may or may not. And I will explain to you that there, we cannot, by any means, determine whether it can or cannot. But what we can say is that it may or may not. So how does this whole thing work? So imagine the disk. Imagine you have a star and a disk around it, and the disk is only gas and dust. When I say dust, I'm talking about micron, uh, sub-micron dust grains. And uh, um, you have all this whole thing. Now, in the port, part of the disk, so the disk is going around your star. This is your star. So at the point, point of the disk, you put a particle there of any size, let's say centimeter size or half a micron, and you give it a flick, initial condition, right? Initial velocity. So it keeps, because of that force that you give it, it starts moving and is subject to the gravity of the star and the gas drag, the drag force of the gas. So it starts moving on its own until the, the combination of these two will balance out and then the, the object loses its independent dynamics and it starts moving with the gas. What you see here is how long will it take for objects of different sizes to lose their dynamics and become part of the gas. For objects of micron size, so what you see here is the distance from the star and the stopping time in terms of Keplerian time. Keplerian time, um, you have um, mass, you have another mass, G M M M M prime over D squared equal mv squared over r, remember your physics 101? That's the Keplerian time, right? So if you don't have anything else and two objects go around each other, uh, that Keplerian times come from there. So <clears throat> for micron size, it takes a long, long, long time for the object, uh, immediately, I'm sorry, immediately loses its uh, independence and it gets, uh, immediately gets attracted by the gas and uh, gets coupled to the gas. For objects of uh, a larger size, it takes a long time for it to lose its independence and, uh, and start moving with the gas. So what does this mean? Now that you have dust particles and they are of a uh, micron size, what does that mean? It means that as soon as you give it that flake, it very soon it loses its independent motion, becomes part of the gas, and it starts rotating. Now you have gas particles 
and you have dust particles. They are coupled, the dust particles are coupled to the gas, they are rotating. There is just one small difference. Dust particles feel the gravity of the sensor star and the uh, uh, gr drag force of the gas. The, the gas molecules don't feel the gravity of the star. So there is a slight, slight difference between the velocity of dust particles and gas molecules. Gas molecules keep hitting the dust particles and move them around, but then two dust particles, depending on where they are, they move uh, very gently because they are heavily coupled to the gas, and because they have relative velocity, they can gently come to each other, close to each other, and when they come very, very close, the molecular cloud... Uh, I am 12 hours jet lag, so bear with me. <laughs> the molecular forces kick in and keep them next to each other. Okay. And then that goes around and sees another one, and the molecular, <laughs> molecular forces kick in and uh, keep them next to each other. So what you see is basically this. Two dust particles stick to one another, and then they stick to another, and they, stick, and they form some sort of small, very tiny fractal type of dust aggregate. And these fractal types go around and uh, hit each other. What you see here is just a cartoon. This is what happens when you put dust particles in uh, um, uh, different type of liquids uh, in, in lab, and you watch them how they move around. The way that dust particles move around depends on their sizes. Uh, for uh, particles of 1 to 100 micron size is the Brownian motion that dictates how they move around. Uh, Brownian motion, um, um, just to um, remind you, um, take a glass of water and put a drop of ink in it and come back tomorrow, the entire ink is all over the water, that's because of the Brownian motion. And uh, um, differential drift, uh, if the object is 100 micron or larger, it moves uh, because of the interaction with the gas through the gas track, it moves toward the central star and the turbulence will affect the motion of the dynamics of the particles that are, have equal sizes. So you end up with objects of um, fractal type are very, very small. You start from a fraction of micron, micron, and you grow to about maybe one micron, two micron. And then these objects go around and hit each other. They are still very, very small, and they are heavily coupled to the gas. So they go around and they hit each other, depending on how fast they move. Sometimes they spread each other into pieces and they go away. Sometimes they actually hit each other and roll each other. And this whole process continues until you go from a a uh, small micron size to something about a centimeter, uh, something about half a centimeter, millimeter size. This is all physics. The physics of it has been worked out some 25, 30 years ago, and uh, it is, uh, that is the part that I said is inevitable. This growth is inevitable. If you have dust particles in gas, this will happen to them. And now the question is how you start from here and form a planet. That is a, a bigger question. <clears throat> so you start from dust particles and you grow them to about um, maybe a millimeter, two millimeters, maybe half a centimeters, and uh, then we go back here. You start from this, now you grow to about millimeter size, it means that your object now shows more of its independent motion. Now it takes longer for it to um, get coupled to the gas. What it means is that at the beginning, when the relative velocity of two dust particles was very, very small and they gently came to each other, now you have uh, centimeter size or millimeter size bodies that are moving more rapidly. And when they come close to each other, they no longer sit next to each other. The molecular forces do not uh, stay, get them next to each other. They actually bang each other, right? And because they are moving really fast, when they hit each other, they may not um, stick. They may break apart. They may get fragmented or they may bounce back. Right. And that gets us to this. What you see is the result of experiment that's been done in the laboratory showing that if you have two objects of different sizes and you hit them, what happens to the outcome? Whether they stick or they break or they bounce uh, or they shatter each other. What you see here is the radius of one object, the radius of another object, and uh, um, the color coding uh, depends on, uh, represents the velocity. So that green means objects of, uh, uh, these objects, when they hit each other, they stick. Then you have bouncing and uh, erosion, and you have fragmentation, and you have cratering, uh, depending on what the size of the object is. So you see, sticking is efficient when the object is at the level of um, micron size and slightly above, uh, above millimeter size. But when it gets to about centimeter size, then look at this centimeter size coming all the way up to that centimeter size. When two objects of centimeter size hit each other, they don't necessarily stick. This is known as centimeter size barrier. 
you get you grow objects based on solely based on physics and you get to centimeter size now objects don't stick to each other anymore and if you could somehow make a mistake and become larger then you have larger objects hitting each other and then they break each other into pieces so the question is what happened how did objects grow past that centimeter size but the issue is not just that one there's a there's a, another issue that um, interaction with the gas through gas track at times causes objects to move forward toward the central star depending on what the relative velocity of the object is the gas track can move the object forward or maybe even backward i'll show you so um, it turns out that the rate of migration towards the central star is heavily dependent on the size of the particle and it maximizes for objects of meter size so even if you could grow these objects past centimeters and get them to meter size the meter size objects are not going to stay around for 200, 300 million years that is necessary to form Earth. They're going to crash into the star. So if that's the case, what happened? How did the nebula manage to form, plan, grow objects to form planets and the planets stay where they are? And that's the, that's the story of uh, planet formation. So this is just a cartoon to show you the migration and the collision and the uh, breakup into pieces depending on the, on the size of the objects and the observations. Uh, the previous talk did a, a great job of explaining all this in detail. I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to throw this question. How did centimeter size body grow to larger sizes? Okay. So for a moment, let's not talk about planet formation. Let me introduce a physical concept. You have a disk. And that disk has uh, gas and dust in it. <clears throat> you know, the disk of gas and dust is not going to sit nice and uh, it's not going to behave nicely just sitting over there doing nothing. There, are, there will be turbulence, there will be variation in the temperature, there will be variation that causes variation in the uh, density and pressure of the gas, and that will affect the dynamics of solid objects in the uh, medium. Okay, so it turns out something very interesting happens. For a moment, assume that um, the pressure in the gas um, maximizes at a certain point, right? And where I'm standing, the pressure of the gas temporarily for about say 5,000 years maximizes here. Now, this is very interesting. Also, assume that the gas, just for the sake of argument, assume that the gas is an uh, ideal gas. So pressure and uh, temperature and density they are related to each other. So when here, when the pressure maximizes, the density of the gas also maximizes. So this is very something very interesting happens. So this is the place where the pressure or the density maximizes. Interior to that, objects, solid particles, go slower than <coughs> than the gas. The gas molecules go faster. So if I'm the, if, if the pressure bump is here and I'm interior to it, uh, let's assume that manual is the star. He is, let's assume that manual is the star. So um, I'm standing here, and as I'm going around manual, right, I get hit on the back by uh, gas molecules. And I absorb, I gain uh, angular momentum, and I move towards that pressure bump. If I'm up here, farther away from pressure bump, as I'm going around, the gas molecule goes slowly, much slower than uh, I'm moving, so I see a headwind. So I lose angular momentum, and I'm spiraled towards the maximum pressure. Then max at the maximum pressure, the derivative of pressure with respect to uh, distance is zero, right? It's maximum, right? So there is no force on me. If I'm here, I come here. If I'm here, I come here, and I accumulate at that maximum pressure. That is what that equation says. For the gas molecules, what you have is the Keplerian motion plus the radiation pressure. The radiation pressure is needed to counter the Keplerian motion. The radiation pressure is needed to counter the uh, expansion of the gas on its own. So at a certain point, if this derivative is zero, it means that pressure maximizes at a, uh, at a certain point. Any object, any solid particle here will absorb the angular momentum, will move back. Any solid particle here will lose angular momentum, will move forward. And they accumulate here. Okay. So for as long as that pressure uh, gradient stays, there is a good chance that it absorbs solid material towards it and forms an aggregate of bigger objects. You don't have to necessarily hit them together. You can, you're just, it's just enough to bring them together. And then if that goes away, that object is that, that uh, accumulation stays there. Now, if somewhere else that pressure bump appears, that one that is now bigger more rapidly moves. Remember the independence and motion uh, 
uh, is less when the object is bigger. Now that accumulation has bigger mass and bigger size, it rapidly moves to the new position where the pressure is maximized. And same thing with others, and that causes this maximum pressure for as long as it lives, it causes objects come towards it and form clumps of bodies, right? Okay. Well, that, that is good, but how does this solve that, that, that problem? How, how did centimeter size, so how did centimeter size grow to larger objects? So uh, you can bring them all together, but still I like didn't tell you how that becomes, say, a meter size or kilometer size body, because we don't know. It is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's an industry base. We don't know. <laughs> I can go through all the models that are presented, but all those models, um, a great portion of every model, especially the underlying assumption, are man-made. They are not coming out of physics, they are put in by hand. So I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to say is that we really, really don't know how to go from centimeter size to uh, larger bodies, but we see the evidence of this that is out there and has objects of larger sizes, right? So from now on, I'm going to use two terms. I'm going to call objects of kilometer size planetesimals, and objects of moon or Mars size planetary embryos. So somehow we managed to go from centimeter size to a disk that has gas and dust and planetesimals and larger bodies. Now again, remember this? Kilometer size bodies take a long, 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 long time to respond to gas. Basically they don't see the gas, they interact uh, with each other through their own gravity, right? So let's see what that does. Let's see if we put gravity here between, say, this object and that object, what comes out of it? What would be the physics that comes out of it? So let's take one of them. Let's, for instance, take that object. OK, so for any object that has mass, no matter what mass is, for any object with mass, you can always define a region around it that any massive body that is inside that region, will, its dynamics will be dictated by its interaction with the object and anything else will be a perturbation. Any object that is farther out, its dynamics will be dictated by everything else, and that one would be perturbation. So let me, I know that I was unclear, so let me uh, explain what that means. Take this body, there is always a region around it, you can calculate that, that if any object is in that region, the dynamics of this object is, is mainly driven by its gravitational interaction with this one, and everything else is perturbation. For objects that are outside, everything else determines the, uh, their dynamics, and that, the effect of that is a perturbation. That region around, we call it Hill's sphere. And it's calculable, you can calculate that with equations, and that's the equations for it and everything. Now, that Hill's sphere plays a very important role. Next talk, you will put that in the context of modeling, and you will see how beautifully it works. But I'm going to tell you the physics of it. Now, um, take, let's take that one and uh, put this, um, objects in this hills, uh, hills sphere, and then let me show you by hand what happens. So you have a little uh, object like this, and there is a hill sphere around it. Another object comes here, it gets absorbed by the central body. The central body's mass becomes a little bit bigger. So because its mass becomes bigger, its hills sphere becomes bigger. So it gets more of the bodies attracted to it. So the mass becomes bigger, the helisphere becomes bigger. So in a very short time, you start from a small body, and these small bodies attract things because of the effect of helisphere, boom, boom, boom. They become large, big bodies. During this process, the, these big bodies affect all the small bodies, either throw them away or absorb them. Depending on where in the disk this happens, you get either giant planets or terrestrial planets. So let's, uh, let's say, for instance, out here, out here, what you have is objects that have ice. So icy bodies um, like um, snowball. Uh, when you take a snowball and hit it to the wall, it sticks much better than take a piece of rock and hit it to the wall, right? So because back here, objects are icy and carry ice, the efficiency of their sticking is much higher. So this process of starting from a small body and then becoming big and big and big, when that happens in that region, in a very short time, it forms a core that is large enough to hold on to itself. That process will do three things. Three things may happen, and that depends on the disk. The first thing is that the bodies, now that these objects are growing, they interact with each other, they throw each other away, they shatter each other into pieces, and nothing remains, right? 
you will have a disk of uh, gas and dust and uh, planetesimals and no planet forms. The other thing happened is the following. Um, so they hit each other, they form a bigger body, this bigger body accretes more of its surrounding, becomes bigger, it gets to a point that can manage to accrete gas from its surrounding. So now, again, look at my hand. Now, you form this object that is so large that it can attract gas from its surrounding. So it attracts gas, it has envelope, gaseous envelope, it becomes bigger. So the combination of the solid core and gaseous envelope has more mass, it attracts more gas. It attracts more gas. It becomes so big that the gas can no longer withstand its own gravity, it collapses. And when it collapses, the collapse and pressure gradient eventually can balance out and you will have your gas giant planet. Right? <laughs> So it depends where in the disk this process happens. You may or may not have gas giant, but uh, it, it will definitely, it must happen in a place where the uh, collision efficiency is high. This, this basically tells you what I just uh, explained, that uh, you start from a small mass and that mass grows, becomes large by accreting more solid material, but the solid material stays because you have basically consumed everything that is in your accretion zone, and then you start accreting gas from your surrounding. And then the gas becomes so massive that it can't stand its own gravity and then collapses. And at that time, you have gas giants. Okay. The third thing that can happen is that this whole process can happen while the uh, object is going through it and is interacting with the disk. So your object is, say for instance, your object is over there and it's going through this process, but it has disk in front of it and behind it. The disk in front of it um, will apply force to it to pull it forward, the disk behind it apply force to it to pull it back. Depending on which one of these forces wins, your object will migrate. And that's when you have migration, you have planet migration. Now, if, that, if planet migration happens while the object is growing, you will have that, you will have type 2 migration. If the planet migration happens as the um, object stops growing or is not growing as efficiently, so you have that one, right? If this happens, you will have a hot Jupiter. If that happens, you will have some Neptune-type uh, planets or Neptune-like planets in closer orbits, depending on which one of them goes. How do we know which one goes? We don't know. It all depends on the disk. So we can, we can look at the final product and say, um, okay, this has come from a type of disk that could accommodate type 2 migration or type 1 migration. And as the migration happens, whatever is in front of the object that is migrating will be affected with it. So, um, I promised not to talk about models, and this is, like I said, sometimes is inevitable. So this is one of the models that I'm showing you. You have a giant planet, it is migrating, and there are a bunch of those planetesimals and planet embryos in front of it. As it plows through them, those objects interact with each other, and they uh, hit each other, and grow and grow, and depending on when the giant planet stops, if the gas goes away and giant planet stops here, you will have um, three uh, super Earth or mini Neptunes in front of it. It stops here, you will have one Super Earth. If it doesn't stop and go all the way, you will have a um, hot Jupiter or it will crash into the star. So the third scenario, which is planet migration, will give you a variety of different types of planets, uh, planetary systems. Um, this is another of those slides that I want you uh, to, um, to remember. Planet formation is a stochastic. That means it is not possible to regulate it, nor is it possible to make predictions with and about it. What does this mean? When you put your telescope towards a star and you get it's wobbling, and then you model and say that it has two planets going around it, you are seeing the final product of planet formation. You don't know how those planets form. You don't know the dynamical evolution of the system. You don't know the initial conditions. You are seeing the final product. And because this whole process is a stochastic. What, what it means is that change one of the initial conditions or change one of these objects from here, put it a little bit back, take that, run it on diff two different computers, you get different results. That's the meaning of a stochastic. Because it is a stochastic, we can never look at the final result and say what, what was the initial condition. It is impossible. This applies to our solar system, to all extrasolar planets. So those that go out and say, I have a three-planet uh, system, let's form them in C2, they're just developing a model. You know, whether that is supported by physics, no. This planet formation is a stochastic. You just don't know where they have come from. Okay, so this is another thing that... Now, what, what if all this that I said, instead of happening back here, happens down here? 
right? The inner part, <coughs> planets are planetesimals dry and they move faster, so when they hit each other, they hit each other and break each other into pieces, right? So now this process, this is the process that I, that I said, the objects hit each other, the um, hill sphere grows and more and more and more, boom, 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 you get large bodies. This process is much less efficient in the inner part of this because objects are dry, right? You have the runaway growth, and then runaway growth results into formation of plan protoplanetary bodies, and then you are, you are doing this in the, uh, this is happening in the inner part, and objects keep, keep hitting each other and shattering into, uh, each other into pieces. Two interesting things comes out of it. One interesting thing is that if you put a bunch of these, say several thousand of them, put them in a disk, and put, a, put the sun over there, and solve the differential equation. Don't do anything to them. Just solve the differential equations. What happens is that you see that they come, they go around, they hit each other. If you make certain assumption for the heating, um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll explain what that means. If you make certain assumption for the growth, you can show that these small bodies, they hit each other and eventually form planetary embryos, moon to Mars sized bodies that are away from each other, five to 10, five to 10 mutual heat radii. That's the heat, heat sphere that I explained. So what does that, that mean? You start from this, you start from a disk, the objects keep hitting each other, and then you end up with a disk that has big bodies in it, moon to Mars size, a bunch of small ones, asteroids, right, Kuiperable objects, and uh, then, then they are all interacting with each other uh, in the inner part where gas is basically gone and all the interactions are through gravity. Okay, so what happens there? <clears throat> okay. Um, objects go around, hit, hit, hit each other, and break into pieces, and they shatter each other. And this is the, this is one of the third slide that you want to uh, that I want you to remember. In the inner part of the disk, mutual interactions among planetary embryos causes these bodies collide with one another, and with planetesimals. The collisions result in breakage and shattering of objects. However, the fact that here's the thing: the fact that terrestrial planets exist indicates that objects must have gone through repeated process of collision and reaccumulation until they grow. They grew to what they are. So they shattered each other. But the fact that this planet exists means that this process somehow resulted into accretion and growth of planet. The inefficiency, this last line is very important. The inefficiency of this process suggests that the formation of terrestrial planets must have taken very, very, very long time. Because you're constantly shattering, reaccreting, shattering, and reaccreting is a very inefficient project, uh, pr process until it gets, uh, it gets done. So this is uh, one of those simulations that we put a bunch of planetesimals and planetary uh, embryos. And uh, with sun, we put them all next to each other uh, with, with sun here. And then we let them interact with one another. And we gave the code a prescription to account for growth. And uh, you, can, you can form uh, terrestrial planets, you can form some asteroids. It basically, the concept is okay, it basically works out. The details, as I will explain, the details is not, uh, that are not okay. So, uh, but the reason I want to show this is that, look at up here, the time is 200 million years, as opposed to formation of gas trions that must take during the time that the gas in this could still exist, within half a million years to about three, four million years. Formation of terrestrial planets in the inner part will take about two, three, four hundred million years, right? It's a long process. Okay, that's, that's another thing, another thing. This is, this is um, in my opinion, this is the most important part of this lecture. Formation of terrestrial planets does not require giant planets. Terrestrial planet formation is solely driven by the mutual interaction of planetary embryos. You can have a system that forms terrestrial planets and has no giant planet whatsoever. Because what causes pl terrestrial planets to form is the interaction of those big bodies, the mutual interaction among them. And that mutual interaction will also disturb and stir the disk. You really don't need giant planets. Giant planets leave their signature, as I will explain, leave their signature in the disk, but they are, not, they are neither required nor, nor necessary for terrestrial planets and also subsequent to that for the appearance of water on Earth. <clears throat> the story for our solar system was, was however different. So up to here, I tried to explain the physics. Um, but now if you want to go back to our solar system, well, the solar system was different. 
And the, why is it different? Because at the time that giant planets were forming, let's, let's put it here. At the time that giant planets were forming, uh, the disk here uh, was doing its own thing. Giant planets formed back here, and that, that formation took less than 10 million years, which means the, um, if the terrestrial planet formation takes about two, three hundred million years, compared to the time that it takes for terrestrial planets to form, formation of giant planets is like that. So for all practical purposes, for all physical model, um, terrestrial planets, when the process of terrestrial planets was continuing, giant planets were there. And giant planets in our solar system, giant planets affected the disk and, uh, and the interaction between uh, objects in the disk. Still, terrestrial planet formation is a result of embryo-embryo interaction. It's not because of giant planet, but giant planet left their sign uh, signature in the disk. So let me explain that, what it means when I say they left signature in the disk. So let's take one of these. I'm going to run this simulation. Let's take a bunch of these uh, objects and let's just run them. And now what you see here is those planetary embryos, moon to Mars sized bodies with a bunch of planet, uh, several thousand planetesimals. Sun is here and uh, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are somewhere back there. It's really not, not important what it is. But uh, let me for a moment, for a second, stop this. Okay, now what you see here is that this disk is showing some sort of property, some sort of characteristic. It has a dynamical characteristic. There are places here where objects' eccentricities increases. And if you look at the location of them and compare with the location of Jupiter, they are in mean motion resonance with Jupiter. There is this little thing that appears up here, which is the effect of Saturn. It actually uh, shows here better. The effect of Saturn. Saturn is affecting uh, the dynamics of objects at that region, about 2.1 AU, and causing their dynamics to, causing their orbits to be, um, to have high eccentricities and get ejected from the system and uh, uh, acting like a wall. Uh, it, um, Saturn back there causes this thing happen and act like a wall to contain terrestrial planet formation to this region. That is why in our solar system we have terrestrial planets interior to 2.1 AU. That is why in our solar system we have asteroid belt that starts from 2.1 AU and goes all the way to about 3.7. The region beyond that is heavily perturbed by Jupiter and it was cleared out. So the reason that we don't have terrestrial planet in this region is because of that thing and these resonances. It's because of our giant planets. If we didn't have giant planets, we still could form terrestrial planets, but they would be all over the place. We wouldn't, most likely we wouldn't have asteroid belt. The reason we have asteroid belt is because this whole process occurred when giant planets are over there, right? So why is this important? If you want to build and develop any model for formation of terrestrial planets, whatever it is, you cannot ignore this. You cannot ignore that. That is, if you take an, uh, with asteroids, if you take the uh, semi-major axis and you <clears throat> plot the numbers of objects with different semi-major axes, there are gaps in asteroid belt. This actually shows them from above. Right? These gaps were recognized by Kirkwood, and they're called Kirkwood gaps. These are where asteroids will be in mean motion resonance with Jupiter. You cannot deny that. This exists. Right? And so does that bump over there. They exist as well, which means that terrestrial planet formation started. The onset of terrestrial planet formation was at the time that Jupiter and Saturn were in their current orbits. So whatever fancy model you want to develop for solar system, you have to make sure that when terrestrial planet formation starts, Jupiter would be at 5.2 AU and Saturn would be at 9.5 AU. Okay. <clears throat> this is also another effect of Saturn. Uh, what you see here is the inclination of the asteroids in terms of their semi-major axis that causes the inclination of the asteroids to be lower than uh, 30 degrees. So again, that cannot be denied. So another issue that comes up with all this terrestrial planet formation is that if we form these terrestrial planets the way that I explained 200 million years and everything, and we form them in the inner part of the disk uh, where there is more heat compared to farther back, why is it that Earth has water on it? So where did that water come from? Uh, Earth must have formed in a dry part of the disk from dry material. Accretion is local, right? If you are forming as a planet here, you accrete whatever is surrounding, uh, surrounding you, right? Remember the hills sphere? It's whatever is surrounding you. And if the material surrounding you is dry, your planet will be dry. But Earth is not, right? So the question is, what happened? 
Well, there are a variety of ways you can account for that. So how did uh, Earth acquire its water? You go back to the disk and you look at the disk and say, okay, let's look at the temperature variation in the disk. Uh, farther back, where the efficiency of growth and formation of gastrion planets is higher, then uh, you have all this icy material, right? So is it possible that ice from here somehow came here after Earth formed and was delivered to Earth through impacts, right? Well, um, it could be you can um, really sit down and uh, do with pen and paper calculate the probability of this happening. And the probability is low. If you go ahead and look at the comets that come from the uh, out, outside the solar system, outside of our, um, the disk of the solar system, and then they come to the inner part, um, the probability is about, um, the probability is so low that it cannot provide more than about 10% or 15% of water. Even if you assume that a comet that comes and hits Earth delivers all this water to Earth and it stays at the phase of liquid, even if you assume that, uh, 10 to 15%. Still, you must have a more efficient pro uh, process to bring in water. That has been done. Those calculations have been done. And uh, um, that is that plus what I'm going to explain uh, are two reasons against, or two arguments against delivery of water post-formation through comets. So one idea is that uh, can water come with comets? Um, the answer to it, one answer is that dynamically, uh, it will not be more than 10, 15 percent. And uh, chemically, uh, the D2H ratio does not agree with the D2H ratio of comets in uh, water in comets, uh, does not agree with D2H ratio of um, ocean waters. So what you see here is the D2H ratio for ocean waters and a bunch of other comets. And this table basically gives you an idea that um, where Earth is, and what is um, for the other comets. And the argument has been that for, um, uh, if water came uh, from comets, the T2H ratio must be similar. Well, those who support the idea that water came with comets um, put aside the dynamics part of it, that you cannot, the fact that you cannot bring in more than 10, 15%. And they argue that the current D2H ratio of water in ocean has been uh, altered, is not the primordial one, has been altered by a variety of different things, including, for instance, uh, uh, development and evolution of life. So even if you agree with what they are saying, uh, still when you do the math, uh, you need a much more efficient process to bring water in. So, what we are going to do is that uh, um, we're going to go back and look at the disk, but this time we'll look at in, uh, the inner part of the disk. Your sun is here, and it hits up the disk. The part that is close to sun is dry, but the capability of retaining water in solid material as you go farther away increases by distance. This is what in previous talk, uh, remember the last two, two three slides, um, where does, remember that question A, B, C, and the answer was C, that the water, um, ice water, um, gets absorbed on the surface of the dust particles. So that's basically what it means. As you go farther away, that efficiency increases. So let's see whether this will help us to account for the water and formation of Earth at the same time, rather than bringing stuff from farther back. So at the moment, this is the idea. And uh, um, now I'm going to let this whole thing run and then what I want you to see is that I have color-coded this uh, um, the disk based on its water content. And uh, what you see is objects hit each other, and then the colors change. And uh, as the colors change, means that some water is being transferred from one part of the disk to the other. And the final product, uh, we'll look at the time, and the final product will have more water. Whoops. OK. And the final product will have more water than it had initially, right? OK, so this one, this is. OK, so that, that takes care of water and forms terrestrial planets. And for a moment, uh, forget about this. I'm going to explain it in two slides. It gives you another important thing. Transfer of water from the outer region of the asteroid belt to the accretion zone of Earth does not require giant planets. It's solely a result of embryo-embryo interaction. The giant planets only clear up the out part of the disk. The formation happens here, and the water from the outer part of the asteroid belt coming to the inner part is the result of successive collisions of embryos to each other. It is not because an object came all the way from here and dumped there. Remember that wall? 
for the effect of Saturn, it doesn't say objects to physically move from one side to the other. But the properties, the chemistry, can go from one object to the other. And that chemistry gets transferred through collisions. So that is why you don't need giant planets to, do, to take something and fly it into the uh, one AU. You just need objects to hit each other and the uh, chemistry goes from one to the other one. <coughs> so how do these codes? I, I just said that um, let's put all this together and I explain this and then I make some assumptions for the collisions and all that. And then I, I promise to tell you what, uh, what that assumption is. So how do the codes that do this uh, do the merging and then transfer of water and whether that has physics behind it. Remember, I promised not to talk about the uh, uh, models, I explained physics. So what is the physics that I'm presenting here? You see, these codes that they do this type of thing, they were originally developed to study the stability, orbital stability of objects, not their growth. They were, they were developed to study whether a planetary system like this can last long for, say, 100 million years, 200 million years. They were not developed to start from planetary embryos, bang them to each other, and grow. Why? Because the n-body codes, the stability codes, uh, they're, they're, um, because when you hit them objects to each other, they're so stochastic, you can't tell what the outcome is. Right? So if you take two objects and bang them to each other, what do you know what comes out of this? It all depends on its chemistry, how soft or hard they are, and how they hit each other. We don't know any of that. And that information is not there. It doesn't go into that. And even if it does, when you have two objects and you hit them each other, you're going to produce, you're going to shatter things and produce millions of bodies, and all of a sudden your code stops. You want to study what happens to these four planets, and once two of them hit each other, your code is going to end up with running a million objects. It's going to stop, right? So to avoid this type of complications, a very, very, very um, basic and uh, unphysical assumption is made. And that unphysical assumption is that you say to your code, <clears throat> when you have two objects and they come at the critical distance, you say what that critical distance is. You say five hill radii, three hill radii. When two objects come that this close, consider them merged and take that merging to be perfectly inelastic. Again, from physics, from high school physics, perfectly inelastic, masses add up, angular momentum, uh, adds up and it gives you the final mass and velocity and the water contact adds up. WMF means water mass fraction. Water contact also adds up as well. So whatever chemistry is here and here it goes into this and you get a bigger object. And that is how this stuff works, right? Except that they have many, many problems. It gives you some idea how this whole um, formation works and what is the physics behind it, but it doesn't give you a quantity, it doesn't give you a quantitative model that you can use for prediction. The reason is for it is that this doesn't happen in reality. I'll show you in a, in a few minutes. So one of the problems that exists is the following. If you take this whole thing and apply this mechanism of growth to it, start from those planetary embryos and planetesimals, and every time two embryos come together, just merge them and make them bigger and bigger, you can form terrestrial planets, and you can form um, asteroids. It's all good. Except that, as you see, Mars is big and more massive than it's supposed to be. This had been known from early 80s when George Bedell created this type of modeling, that when you do this, um, Mars becomes big, is known and, as a uh, massive Mars problem. Mars becomes big. So <clears throat> we believed in what we were doing, including myself. I had the privilege of working with George Bedell, and at that time I never thought of this, that uh, 25 years later I stand over here and say that was incorrect. So um, uh, we, we believed in this so much that we actually consider Mars problem to be real. We close our eyes to the fact that the Mars problem is because of our bad assumption. We consider that to be real. And we then develop models for it. Right? That is uh, the Grand Tech model. Next talk we'll talk about that. Um, you want Mars to be small. And remember, accretion is local. If I want my mass to be small, there should be less mass around me to accrete. So somehow, you have to get rid of the mass in the location of Mars so what, when accretion happens, there's not enough amount to, to accrete to become large, right? So one way would be to let giant planets migrate inward. But then remember, if you let it be over there, then all those properties of asteroid belt will not be satisfied. You have to bring them inward and then rapidly take them back 
when terrestrial planet formation starts, they're going to be at 5.2 and 9.5. 9 9 so asteroid belt will have its own properties, right? This is called Grand Tech model, right? So um, I leave it to next talk to explain it. This is another model that um, Andre Isidoro and I developed for Andre's uh, PhD. So we said that we're not going to mess around with giant planets. We let giant planets do their own migration and everything. But what we're going to do is that we're going to take the disk to be more realistic rather than taking a disk that we present with a nice, smooth, uh, uniform mathematical function. We take a disk that is bumpy. Some part of the disk has more mass compared to other parts. And then it turns out that if the region that has less mass compared to other parts is close to the region where Mars is, you can actually get a Mars-sized body. This is, this is a simulation of that. You start from the disk that is um, nice and neat, but then you introduce all these non-uniformities uh, to it. And then there is some non-uniformity here. And then you, you use that bad assumption, uh, perfect merging. And then you will get asteroids, you will get terrestrial planets, you get water, you get Mars that is a small. Every time I showed this in the past, people ask me, the first question was, really? I mean, Mars is going to have that much water? And then I have to tell them, oh, come on. This is because of our bad assumption. And as soon as you say that, as soon as you say it's because of the, um, the assumption that you have to put into n-body codes, they just turn their back and walk away. They never listen to you. What is the reason? Uh, the reason for it is that, let's go this way. In reality, collisions produce they're not going to be like perfect merging. It's going to be like this. Objects are going to hit each other. They're going to produce a bunch of uh, millions and millions of uh, debris. Uh, things go away. Things get absorbed. And it becomes, it looks like this. So if that's the case, the reason that Mars was thought to be a problem was that we were using a wrong assumption for growth. We were not treating it well. You know, Mars problem is a computational problem. It is not a physics problem, right? What does that mean? It means that these simulations that we present, all the simulations that are presented through n-body codes, they are all for proof of concept. They are not quantitative, and you cannot use them for predict making predictions. They are all for proof of concept. It gives you an idea what should be the range of the initial condition, what should be uh, the, where your giant planets should be, what should be the time, of, what physics have to go into it. But these models are not for quantitative purposes, and they cannot make predictions. If you want to make quantitative purposes, uh, if you want to make a model for quantitative purposes, then you have to treat collisions realistically. A realistic model of terrestrial planet formation has to be quantitative and be able to model collision and transport, of, transport and transfer of volatiles realistically so you can make uh, predictions. Uh, but, let's, but this type of simulations, okay, uh, create a huge, a large number of bodies. So if you want to integrate objects after collision, as soon as the first collision happens, you start from a disk of, say, um, a couple of hundred planetary embryos and a, and a thousand um, planetesimals. As soon as two Mars-sized bodies hit each other and break each other into pieces, all of a sudden you have billions of objects and your code crashes. So what do you, what do? You do? Um, there are some solutions around that. Uh, how much time do you have? Um, define a prescription. Say that depending on the relative velocity of two objects and depending on their sizes, I'm going to take only the top four fragments and I'm going to ignore everything else. And there are some, um, there are some uh, uh, codes that they do this. Or use a collision catalog. You can actually do, run uh, millions of simulations to see what happens. I showed you um, two of them for objects that are hitting each other and sticking at the beginning of the talk. You can run some of those simulations, and then you can say, um, well, depending on what the relative velocity is, um, I can, based on that catalog, I can predict what will be the outcome. And you can go that way. The only problem is that this, this will get you around the uh, issue of creating uh, billions of particles, except that these models can move you forward, but cannot account for the transfer the chemistry, for the transfer of water and volatiles from one object to the other. You have to come up with a way that these objects, um, the chemistry will also uh, is accounted for. I'm, I'm showing you some more of the simulations of the current models, so you see that um, you can form bodies uh, and uh, get around the, the fact that uh, your n-body code may crash, uh, but uh, transfer of objects, uh, transfer of the chemistry, transfer of uh, volatiles and water from one object to the other has to be taken into account. Okay, so 
what is the difference between this type of doing the problem this way and doing the problem um, with perfect merging? This graph will show uh, that this graph shows you the difference. What it shows is that if you do perfect merging and you do um, the collision through the SPH and all the things that I showed you, how much? What is the difference between them? The perfect merging. This basically shows that uh, for per collision, the perfect merging um, will. Uh, overestimates the amount of mass and water and volatiles transfer from one body to, uh, to the other by about 20-25% per collision. Now I'm going to finish my talk to take that per collision and put it in the context so you see what that means. Take one of these, take one of that uh, objects that became final planet and then uh, um, I, I went back through the history of the, how that object grew and then I noticed that um, it was a, uh, initial mass was about a third of mass on, on Mars. It hit 15 times with planetesimal kilometer sized bodies and three times by moon to Mars sized bodies. Okay. So <clears throat> um, this is just a cartoon. Let's say object started from here and then during this evolution it was hit here, hit here, hit here, hit here. Remember that formation takes about 200 million years, right? So from one, going from one other to the other uh, point of collision, the object uh, may go around for millions and millions of years. You know, you get hit once and the next hitting you may come 5 million years down the road, next one may come 20 million years down the road. But during this time, when you get hit once, something happened to you. And what happens is the following. As you get hit, you lose mass. As you get hit, you get cratered. And then when those craters happen, when you lose mass, when you lose mass here, for the next five million years, your orbital evolution is different from uh, having an orbital evolution without, with the original mass. So the transport of water and chemical has to do with the thermal evolution of the embryo during the uh, orbital evolution and has to do with the mass and uh, what happens to the craters and everything. So um, let's see, for instance, you get hit and you have that crater, right? Let's see what happens. Um, so you get hit and you have craters. Now the craters will expose some ice on their walls. And if you get hit here for the next five million years, that ice is going to evaporate. So when you come here and get hit again, and you transfer some of your water, the water here is very different from the water over there. Right? That has to be taken into account. Right? And uh, this is basically what I just explained, that uh, you get hit and uh, ice gets exposed, ice evaporates, and what you have after the collision is not what you had at the beginning. So if you take perfect merging, you are ignoring all these effects. And you are also, all these effects have been worked out. And uh, you can actually start, um, you can actually take your embryos and hit them to each other. And then uh, determine, based on those equations, determine how much water evaporates as it goes from one orbit to the other orbit. And then put that in your code. That has been done. And that brings me to, uh, my last two slides. So what did I say before I, I, I go through this? I said that if you take the perfect merging, you are overestimating your, uh, you're overestimating your mass and your water contents for every collision by about 20-25%. That object that I showed you had three big collisions. So at the first collision, 20% is lost. In the second collision, 20% of the 80% is lost, right? That is 16%. And then so 80% dro drops to 66, uh, 64. And then in the third one, 20% of 64, which is 13% is lost, so you drop to 50%. So the original one would include the entire water of it. Defined, if you do it right, the water that gets transferred to another body is only 50%. So the, um, it's very important that all this be taken into account. During this time, from the time that the uh, first collision occurred to the time that the object formed take 200 million years. Every of these collisions revealed um, ice in the craters and all that. That ice evaporates as well. So not only you use 50% just because of the collision, you lose some more water because of evaporation as well. You have to take that into account as well. Right? And once you take that into account, and then you can put that in your n-body code and develop it and make it uh, a model. And this is what we are hoping to do. So this is the slide with no results, no conclusion, just, uh, just saying that uh, the model that is supposed to be uh, quantitative and be able to make predictions has to take all that into account. So that's a big challenge. Um, we're hoping within the next two or three years we'll have such a model, but at the moment uh, we are working on it. So um, I'm going to finish my talk uh, by presenting my conclusion. First, when collisions, <coughs> mm -hmm. 
When collisions treated correctly, classical model of terrestrial planet formation can form solar system analogs. There is no need to develop exotic models to account for the formation of Mars using perfect merging. Perfect. Mars problem is a technical problem, it is not a physics problem. Water and other chemicals are transferred through successive collisions between planetary embryos. Nothing gets flung from one side to the other side. Uh, meaning that the chemical composition of planets and their water content cannot be determined post-formation. So one of the advantages of that uh, perfect merging scenario is that you can look at your final product and then you can step back through the dynamics and see where the object has come from, how many times it was hit, and what objects contributed to it. You can no longer do that. You have seen many of those, are, those of you uh, interested in planet formation, I'm sure you have seen many of these that they say, oh, um, I have the final objects and I can tell you where 5% of its mass came from, uh, you know, 5 AU, 2% of it came from, 3.4 AU and all that. That is all incorrect. I mean, seriously, I'm sorry if some of you are doing this for a living, that is incorrect. Because collisions have, when, when objects hit each other, they shatter each other into pieces. They're, they're, um, remember those SPA simulations? Who knows what happens? There is no perfect merging. And because of that, the chemistry cannot be tracked back. Loss of water during impact implies that at time t equals zero, the water content of planetesimals and planetary embryos in the protoplanetary disk was higher than is traditionally considered. So this classical picture tells us um, what is the water content here is about 0.1. It has to be much larger than that. Because you are, remember, I just took one example and I showed you lose something like 60, 65% of the water by the time the object is formed. So if you want to have Earth with about 0.01% water, you have to start with much higher than traditional models consider. And uh, um, if those of you who are um, interested in the dynamics of the solar system might have heard of the model, NIST model, and uh, I very much encourage you to read this article uh, that came out last year by Alessandro Morbidelli, the creator of the NIST model. The timeline of the lunar bombardment revisited where he uh, shows evidence that um, the NIST model uh, is no longer valid, is not there. Um, so please read that. And, uh, <laughs> so um, many of us told him from the beginning, but he didn't believe, you know. Um, observation, observation on lunar geological and meteoritic data are needed to constrain the surface density profile of this composition and protoplanetary disk. Thanks so much.